And I'd been okay with hand-me-downs, with secondhand clothes all of these years. But all of a sudden, I wanted my own stuff. I wanted something to come with my name on it that had specifically been chosen for me. There ought to come a time in your relationship with the Lord where hand-me-down revelation just doesn't do it for you anymore. There ought to come a time in your relationship with the Lord when hand-me-down revelation just doesn't cut it anymore. Let me ask you the obvious question. Is the Bible quote-unquote hand-me-down revelation then, according to the way she's describing hand-me-down revelation? Yeah, you bet it is. Now we thank God for our pastors and our teachers. Of course we do. Uh, we thank God. Is there a but in there? I'm just wondering, if, because if there's a but, it's going to erase it. And our leaders that help us to rightly divide the word of truth. But they're on a... But, but, you see, we thank God for our pastors, but... Listen again. Word of God from someone else to you. Now we thank God for our pastors and our teachers and our leaders that help us to rightly divide the word of truth. But there ought to come a time in your life where you've decided, you know what? I want fresh revelation with my name on it. I want fresh revelation. In, where in the Bible does it say you need to expect fresh revelation with your name on it? It's come straight from God's spirit for my life. No biblical text says this. I'm going to point out a few things that a lot of people don't pay too much attention to, all right? So let's begin then, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Now, note it says all, and all means all. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus. He's the one who calls the shots. And the church has been given a task by King Jesus, the one who has all authority. You, you don't get to, con you do not have uh, authority over Jesus. You don't get to veto his word. And there is, there are no elections that take place that you can have in order to overturn Jesus's kingly reign and uh, and uh, and put in the person that you want with the progressive agenda that you're looking forward to seeing happening. So let let's just make this clear. Jesus calls all the shots, not only in his church, in all the world. Period. Full stop. And you are either believing and obeying. Now I'm going to say obeying here in this regard is going to be more along the lines of law. But understand this: that those who obey Christ are the ones who have faith in him, trust in his promises for the forgiveness of their sins, and they have been brought to real repentance. They have recognized that they were in the wrong, God is in the right, they have called out to Christ for mercy, and they are confident that Christ forgives them of all of their sins because of what he has done for them on the cross. And then Christians, in true fear, love, and trust in God, in penitent faith, they bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and they keep and they guard the words of God, the words of Christ. All right? So, as a Christian, all authority has been given to Christ, and it's wonderful. I have retired from being a deity. I was a terrible deity anyway. And uh, me vetoing Jesus, that makes n no sense. And it doesn't make sense when you do it either. So let's begin with those words, all authority, all authority. So he calls the shots in heaven, on earth, in the church, in the world, period. And you're either on board or you're in rebellion against him. That's all there is to it. So he then gives the church this task. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. And I'm going to note, the go is not in the imperative. The make disciples is in the imperative. Go is in the is, is a participial phrase. So as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then watch this last part. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, there, uh, there's a lot of talk in, uh, in uh, the visible church regarding the topic of what's called sola scriptura. 
here's the question I have for you. Since King Jesus, the one who has all authority in heaven and earth, has said to the church, they are to make disciples and what they are to be discipled in. By the way, a disciple is a learner, all right? So what's the curriculum? The curriculum is all that Christ has commanded. Nothing more, nothing less. Your opinions, philosophy, uh, speculations, mad ravings, uh, fever dreams, dreams caused by the fact that you ate a bad burrito last night with a really awful beer. All of those things are ruled out, okay? In the church, the only thing that gets to be taught is what Christ has commanded, which begs the question, where do I go to find what Christ has commanded? Now, this, in, this should be basic. Jesus is none other than the Son of God in human flesh. There is only one God, and he exists in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are not three gods, there's only one. So when the God of the Old Testament has spoken and commanded, that's Jesus speaking by virtue of the fact that he's the same God as the God of the Old Testament. So, and Jesus makes it clear in Mark 7 that God is the one who commanded through the Old Testament text. And we're going to note here that Jesus quoted from all three sections of the Old Testament and quoted them as authoritative and as having their origin in God. That includes the Torah, it includes the prophets, it includes the histories. So all three portions of the Old Testament Christ quoted from and quoted from them authoritatively as coming from God. Jesus never quoted from the Apocrypha. Keep that in mind. So all of that being said, we can say, all right, Christ has spoken to us. Well, he's spoken to us via the Old Testament for sure. All right, and you said there. Well, that's a weird way to talk. Jesus is in the New Testament. The God is the, uh, the the God of the Old Testament seems cranky. No, no, no. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Full stop. And uh, you don't agree with that? You need to read your Bible. All right. So Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Now, what about the other stuff? Well, we noted in the last installment of Fighting for the Faith, in John chapter seventeen, uh, Christ in his high priestly prayer on the night that he's betrayed before he's about to be crucified. So, you know, he's got less than 24 hours to live. Christ prays this prayer. Uh, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave to me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. They have kept your word. And now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. So Christ received his message from the Father. Christ delivered his word, the words of the Father, to whom? His apostles. All right, these are the guys who are going to go on to become uh, the apostles. He reiterates that in verse 14, I have given them your word. And then Jesus says in verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, and watch this. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Christ commands the disciples, after all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to them, to make disciples, teaching all that Christ has commanded, and he has delivered to the apostles his words. And wh where do we go now to hear the words of Christ? Answer, the writings of the apostles, so that they may be all be one, just as you are a father in me and I in you, and they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. How do we do that? Through the words of the apostles. Everyone who believes in Jesus believes in the words that they spoke and wrote, that they wrote, and that's the only place we can go to obey Christ's command to teach all that I have commanded. All right. This is the reason why, then, if you consider Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So note what it says here in Hebrews 1. God spoke to our fathers, how? By the prophets. 
But in these last days, he has spoken, past tense, has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So where can I go to hear the voice of Christ if he has already spoken? Answer, any any gospel, any letter, any book written by an apostle of Jesus Christ, one sent by him, has received from Jesus the words that Jesus received from the Father, and people are to believe in Jesus through their words. This is the only place I can go and know that I'm hearing the word of God. I'm hearing his voice. It's in the Old Testament, and it's also in the New. And there is no other place to go. None whatsoever. Period. Full stop. All other voices, I must assume, are false voices. The voice of the devil, the voice of my sinful appetites, uh, the, the, the ravings of a lunatic. And if anyone comes to me and says to me, God sent me to tell you, I will say, whoa, what, what sign can you perform to prove to me that God sent you to, set, to give me a message? We're, we're going to need some proof here. And so full theological audit is in order, uh, you know, <laughs> all kinds of things. Before I'm even going to let you utter a word, you're going to have to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God sent you. I know that God sent the prophets of the Old Testament, and I know that God, that Christ sent the apostles. As for everybody else, I don't know who they are. I, I, I don't know who they claim to be because over and again, the people claiming to be hearing the voice of God. And then speaking those words that, you know, directly to everybody, uh, 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 over and again, I can demonstrate with this much effort that the words that they're speaking contradict the, the Bible and that they twist scripture. All right. So let me give you another text along these lines. And uh, that is going to be Ephesians chapter two. And consider the implications here. Ephesians chapter two, specifically verse 20 and so here's what it says, for through him, we have both access in one spirit to the father. This is verse 18 for context. Uh, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and you are members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the household of God, according to God, the Holy Spirit through the apostle Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What's that referring to? The Bible. Any other voice that's coming to you is not the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's something different altogether. Okay, so you got that. And let me throw into the mix here. Then two other texts that would I go to on a regular basis. Second Peter chapter one, and this is the last Peter, uh, epistle that Peter writes before he's martyred. He's going to end up being crucified upside down. It's going to take him three days to die. And this is the last letter he writes before that. And here's his last will and testament written to the church at large. Uh, and pay close attention to where he points people to, not to inner voices, not to spiritual experiences uh, or anything like that. He points him to something very specific. And so Peter says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, Patricia King would be willing to sell her mother into slavery in order to have a religious experience like this. And yet Peter here is gonna make it very clear that what we have as Christians now is even more sure and certain than the voice he heard speak from heaven. And that's the point. So, and we have, listen to what he says. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. The prophetic word. What's he referring to? The prophetic word. He ain't talking about Cain Ash. He ain't talking about, 
<laughs> All the people we feature on Prophecy Bingo. He ain't talking about Ebola Adelani. No, he's talking about the Bible. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So you're going to note this. Until the return of Christ, the prophetic word is the thing that speaks to us. This is the voice of God. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. And notice what he calls it. Prophecy of what? Scripture. All right? For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter, before he dies, what's he pointing us to? No, no still small voice. No hearing voice, Jesus speaking into your heart. No, he's pointing us to the prophetic word. God has spoken to us through his son in these last days. And the only place I can go to hear the words, the voice of the son of God is in the apostolic text in the New Testament. Straight out. That's all there is to it. So uh, last text along these lines, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. This is 2 Timothy 2. This is Paul's last letter before he's martyred. He's going to have his head taken off his shoulder by a Roman centurion. Understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self. Check. Lovers of money. Mm -hmm. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, denying its power, avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into household and capture weak women, burdened with sins, led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. I think of... Hillsong, Saddleback, I think of Carl Lentz and his spectacular fall, but nobody should have been surprised about his spectacular fall at all, because for years we've been warning people about these seeker-driven, charismatic churches, that they're ticking off all of the boxes here, that they, the people there are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, unappeasable, slanderous full of all kinds of passions that are sinful, right? And they don't call people to repent. They scratch itching ears and tell people what they want to hear. And uh, and so then Paul then says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also, they oppose the truth. They are corrupted in mind. They are disqualified regarding the faith. Uh, but they, uh, they will not get very far. Their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings. Yes, that's right. If you're a Christian, expect those two things. And if you're not getting them, you need to question a few things. It's like, oh, I must be doing it wrong. Uh-huh. All right. Persecutions and sufferings that, uh, that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, uh, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire a, give, a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors, they will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, uh -huh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, all scripture is breathed out by God. Theonoustos. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Not some, every. This is the only place you can go to hear the voice of God. It's the prophetic writings of the Old Testament, and Moses was a prophet as well as the apostolic writings of the New Testament. It's the only place you can go to hear the voice of God. And since Christ, the one who all authority has been given to, who said that we are only to teach and disciple people with the things that he's commanded, nothing else gets to be added. Only the scriptures, rightly taught, rightly divided. So I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing, and his kingdom preach the word. That's it. 
Be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They'll turn away from listening to the truth, wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Scripture is the only place I can go to hear the voice of God. And if you read your Bible, you will come to the same conclusion. That is the only place you can go to hear the voice of God, to hear the voice of Christ. And in Christ's church, Scripture and Scripture alone is to be preached. He has said that. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Make disciples, teaching them all that I have commanded. Nothing more, nothing less. Only the voice of Christ, only the voice of God gets to speak in Christ's church. The job of a pastor is to preach the word. And when a pastor preaches anything different or any Christian preaches anything different and says that's the voice of God, they are liars, they are deceivers, and they are causing you to try to get you to trust in words that are lies from a voice that is not the voice of God.